My message this morning, the unrelenting love of God. The unrelenting love of God. Second Corinthians 13th chapter, please. <clears throat> Starting at verse 11. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. Now, here's my text. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Father, I thank you for your unrelenting love. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of truth that sets men free. And I humble myself before you. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to take every word that you've given me, and anoint it now. Without the anointing, it's a dead letter. And I ask you to anoint me with your Holy Spirit. I've been with you, Lord, and I know you have placed this on my heart. You've opened my mind to this. And I pray that you would give us an understanding of the love of God today. Lord, we've heard about it. We've tried to understand it, but we do not yet fully understand the uh, magnitude and the glory of your love for this world and for your people especially. And we ask you now to open our hearts and our minds to receive it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Unrelenting love of God. This word unrelenting means that which does not diminish in intensity and effort. It cannot be diminished. It means it's unyielding. It's not capable of being persuaded by arguments. Not capable of being changed. It's uncompromising. In other words, it's sticking to a determined course. And what a marvelous description of the love of God. The marvelous description. Nothing can diminish or hinder his loving pursuit of both sinners and saints. Nothing can hinder him in his pursuit of love for his people. David the psalmist expressed it this way. God, you have beset me behind and before. In other words, you've closed me in. You've hedged me in. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Where shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, or if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. David's talking about his lifestyle, the times in his life when he was very high, feeling good. He's talking about having such lows that he's like a living hell. If I make my bed in hell, if that's my human condition. Sometimes my human condition is is everything is going fine. Everything is all right. There are other times that I am so low. I feel unworthy. I feel condemned. And he's talking about literally uh, experiencing a hellish uh, manifestation in his life. And yet he said, I can't get away from your presence. I can't get away from your love. You're still pursuing me. (coughs) No matter where I go, no matter how I've drifted away, No matter my human condition, you were there. Your love is unrelenting. I can't chase you away. You don't even accept my arguments against or or why you shouldn't love me. You find that all through the writings of David through the Psalms. God, even when I argue with you that I'm unworthy, that I've sinned against grace. Now, David sinned incredibly against, uh, he, he had godly men who were mentoring him. He he had the Holy Spirit ministering to him. He had the law. He loved the word of God. He said it was a lamp to his feet. And in spite of all of this, David sins grievously against God. You know the story of David's sin. You know how he lusted after another man's wife and how he got her pregnant. And then to cover up his sin, he brings her husband home from the battlefield and gets him drunk trying to get him back into his wife's bed. And when that failed, he connives uh, with uh, the leader of his army to have the man killed. And Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is killed, literally murdered, sent into a hopeless situation on the battlefield. And God said, it was a grievous, evil thing that you've done, David. And he sent the... The thing David had done, the scripture said, displeased the Lord. God sent the prophet Nathan to him and he said, you have despised the word of the Lord. You've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Now, God disciplined David for his sin. 
You can be sure, no matter what your past has been or your experience of the Lord, how deep you've been in Christ, how you've walked with God, when you sin against the light, you're going to... You're going to be disciplined. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And David is disciplined. The baby died. And it grieved David's heart. But God never abandoned. He he, he kept pursuing David with his love. Bathsheba gives birth to a son. And the scripture says, And David called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. He loved Solomon. He loved David. God's love was unabated still unrelentlessly chasing after him, expressing his love at all times. You find it all through the Scripture. You go to the New Testament and look at Saul of Tarsus, making havoc of the church, entering into homes of many Christians, dragging them off to prison. The Scripture said he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You see him going to the high priest asking for letters to scour the country to find other Christians to murder and imprison. And yet, Paul, after Saul, after conversion, when he became Paul the Apostle, said, Even when I was in sin, even when I was a murderer and I hated Christians, believers, I hated, he still loved me. Here's the scripture. But God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said amazing grace that even then, though I were not, I was not conscious of it, God was pursuing me. The unrelentless love of God kept coming after me until that day that he literally knocked me off my high horse. It was the love of God. Paul testified that God loved him when he was blind. When he was full of racial prejudice, God's love was still with him, even when he had murder in his heart. Why don't you go to Romans 8th chapter, and let's see it magnified uh, in, er, in Paul's own words. 8th chapter of Romans, verse 38 and 39. This is Paul's persuasion. For I am persuaded, this is Romans 8, 38. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, things present or things to come, not height, not depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, he loved me before I was a believer. No, he didn't wink at my sin. Yes, I've understood his chastening hand. But God never stopped loving me. He never stopped pursuing me. And he said, now that I am his, there is no devil, there is no demon, there is no principality, there is no power. There is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. There is nothing that can stop God from loving me. Please hear what the Spirit's saying. Nothing can separate you from his relentless love. We find that almost impossible to believe. When we sin and fail God, we lose the sense of his love. And then when anything bad happens to us, we say, God's whipping me. God's angry at me. There's a problem here and a trouble here and something else breaks out. And we say, well, and, and really what we're saying, God has stopped loving me because there's some failure in my life. I, I, I have displeased him. He's angry at me. Or we blame it at the devil. Of course, the devil is active in this way, many, many occasions. But you see, all of these things that happen around you do not affect. It's not a result. It's not always the result of of, of God turning against you. Not at all. It's, it's that we're not comprehending his love. We're not understanding that God still pursues No matter what the trouble, no matter what we're going through, he continues and relentlessly pursues both saint and sinner. Paul wrote, by the way, I don't believe you can face what's coming. All the terrors that are now existing in the world and, and all of the things that are ahead of us, both in your personal life and in the world scene, I don't know how you're going to make it until... You are convinced God loves you. 
How can you make it? If, if, if you have to live under this sense that God is angry at you and that somehow God doesn't love you because you're unworthy, you're unfaithful, and there's, you're still struggling with sin, and you feel that God is, there's no way God could love me. There's no way a holy just God could love me the way I am. And if you have to live under that, you'll never make it. It'll tear you down. It'll lead to a nervous breakdown. It can lead to insanity. The thing that keeps the thing that keeps us sane in this day, the thing that keeps us with hope and joy in our heart is that we are convinced that God loves me. God loves me. Paul wrote two epistles to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And in one sentence now, at the end of the last book, the text that I've just read to you, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Now, this verse has been used as a benediction. It's, it's used as a benediction when a service is closed usually. Now may, the, the, now, now, may the grace of God, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you now and forever. That's a benediction. No, it's not a benediction. This is a prayer, a one-verse prayer that sums up everything God, Paul is trying to teach about the love of God. He said there are three issues involved here. There are three things I want you to understand, and may it be with you all the time, now and forever. Get this in your mind, get this in your understanding, and you will never again doubt the love of God. <clears throat> this one-verse prayer deals with these three divine issues, and I want to talk to you about them. Let's start with the grace of God. Just what is grace? Now, now we know whatever it is, the Scripture said it's to teach us to deny ungodliness, unworld, or worldly lust, live soberly, righteously in this present world. How do I reach this place that says the Holy Ghost is going to teach or grace is going to teach me how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. What is that teaching? Holy Ghost, you're my teacher. Give me. This is a foundational truth. What, what is it now? You're saying that if I have grace, if I understand the grace of God, this is going to teach me how to live a holy, godly life. I want to live a holy, godly life, so Holy Spirit... What is the teaching? What is the foundation of grace? You find it in 2 Corinthians. Don't turn there, but 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 8, chapter, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He said, now you want to know what the grace of God is? Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he gave up his riches, became poor, that you and I may become rich. Now, I can bring up so many, I'll bring up numerous scriptures that prove that this is not material riches. In fact, the material, to those who are materially rich without Christ, especially, are those who pursue riches or those who have a love of money, which is the root of all evil. Uh, how, how would he suggest that this is, that he, he's going to bless you with the root of all evil? No, the scripture is full of spiritual riches. Paul speaks of the riches of his glory, the riches of wisdom and riches of grace, unsearchable riches of God in Christ Jesus, true riches as against the deceitfulness of riches of the world. Rich in good works, rich in faith, rich in mercy. Here's what it is. Here's what Paul's saying, summing it all up. Jesus Christ came in this world to bless, edify, and build up others at his own expense. He came to show and manifest this very character of God. Jesus didn't come to magnify himself, to glorify himself as a human being. 
It's all through the scripture. He gave when he came up. He surrendered the, the privilege of this capital I, me or mine. The capital I. In other words, emphasis on me and my blessings and me personally. He gave up every opportunity to pray down blessings upon himself at the expense of others. How many, how many of us lack this grace? We can't see other people blessed. We can't under, we can't really rejoice when somebody else gets ahead of us. A neighbor gets a car so far beyond yours, puts in a swimming pool, and you can hardly pay your bills. Bring it into the church, bring it into the body of Christ. And you see God blessing others with spiritual gifts and he's honoring them. He's doing something special with them. Are you able to rejoice in that? Are you able truly and honestly to say, I am glad, I rejoice in this. God bless them. You see somebody being blessed in their home and their marriage and their children. Their children are becoming very blessed. You know, they're, they're, and, and for pastors, this is especially a, a needed grace. Oh, how this is needed <laughs> for pastors who see a friend or a neighbor pastor somewhere just taking off with the blessings of God, apparently. God just poured his blessings on, and here I am. This man is struggling in prayer, and he doesn't see it. And he's not yet seen the fullness of blessing in his own life. But all oh, the grace, the grace to be able, to be able to... Continue in what you feel is your spiritual poverty and rejoice in the riches and blessings of others. This is the grace he's talking about that he wanted the Corinthian church, the Corinthian people to experience. Christ didn't come to glory in his achievements, his power, his ability. He came to build up the body. He would hear his disciples glory in his miracles and he would back off and say oh you're going to do far more than me he said when I'm gone greater works than these are you going to do you see he was already rejoicing in the greater works that his subordinates will experience and when the report came back that his disciples were going everywhere and the demons were subject and they were doing these great miracles multiplied more than Christ himself had ever achieved up to that time, and Jesus danced with joy. Oh, God, I want to know that grace. The grace of God. This unrelenting love of God in Christ is preferring others above yourself. Let love be without hypocrisy. Be kindly affectioned, affectioned one to another. In honor, preferring one another. In honor, prefer those around you. Now, in 1 Corinthians, you find very little of that kind of grace. Very little of that grace is in 1 Corinthians. Read it through and you'll see what I mean. Instead, you find competition in the things of God. You find men glorying in spiritual gifts, a church full of self-exaltation. You find Christians jostling for position. It's all there. They're going to court, suing one another. They're self-seeking, self-important. Even at the communion table, they were strutting with pride at their in arrogance at all of the, the special foods and exotic things they were bringing to the table, while the poor around them had nothing it was all contrary to the grace that Paul was preaching. First Corinthians is stamped with an immense I, me, mine, taking and not giving. God knew their hearts. He knew all about it. He knew the fornication, the incest. He, he, he knew all this is going on in the church at court. In fact, even today, when you talk about Carnality, you think of the Corinthian church. Even today, that is stamped with the mark of carnality. And in spite of that, 
What amazing grace. The Holy Spirit inspires Paul to open up his greeting to these people, the same people. He greets them as the church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Incredible. Can you imagine the people at Corinth when that letter was read and open up? And here are people of carnality. There's fornication in the church, so much so that Paul turned, went over the devil, destruction of the flesh, and the soul might be saved. And, and all of this going to law against one another and this individualism and all of this self. And yet Paul comes along and he writes to, to the church, God's church, Christ's church, sanctified. Sanctified? Called to be saints? Paul is under divine inspiration. Is God winking at their sin? No. But God knows they have no resources to fight their sin. Because there's carnality. They are not in a position. They are not understanding the love of God and the love of God. God on his own. It's unmerited, unconditional love that he comes to these people. And he said, you're still my children. I call you saints. I call you sanctified. Now, just listen very closely. God is not winking at sin. He is securing his people. There has to be a position contrary to your condition. In other words, if God just, do, just judged you and I on our condition, we'd be saved one day and unsaved the next day. We'd get saved ten times a day. Backslide ten times a day. You can't understand this until you understand this word, position. My position in Christ. Now, my condition right now is struggle. My condition that I'm still fighting. I'm still trusting. I, I am not where I should be. There's still weakness and frailty in my flesh. But I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, and I trusted his covenant promises. And so he seats me in heavenly places with Christ. That's my position. And God says, I look at you at your position in Christ. Your position in Christ. You claim that. And when you claim that, God said, I want you secure. I want you without that fear that I'm giving up on you. And then you come to this. Once you see that, you come to this. You come finally to 1 Corinthians 1.30. But I am in Christ Jesus, who now of God has become my wisdom, my righteousness, my redemption. Now he's become, he set me free of my fears and my bondage. He tells me he still loves me for one reason. That I can now claim his righteousness, his holiness. His purity in my heart. Because he's secured me. He's secured me in his grace. Doesn't mean that I'm not talking about eternal security. Because you can absolutely, absolutely turn away from the love of God and reject it until your heart gets hard. And the love of God cannot penetrate the walls that you, that you erect yourself because of rejection. The second issue Paul speaks of is the love of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians, grace is needed because of their failure. In 2 Corinthians, you find the focus now is on the love of God. Now, this, this second chapter of Corinthians proves that the love of God, this pursuing love of God, is power to change. It's power to change. You know, I want you to follow me closely on this. Jesus, our Lord, said he didn't come to condemn but to save. I read from John twelve forty seven. For I came not to judge the world but to save the world. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now, in 1 Corinthians, you find a powerful truth about God's unrelenting love. It's in verse 4. Christ, or rather, charity. Charity. You remember this, this passage of Scripture. 
First Corinthians 13 is all about the love of God. In verse 4, charity or love suffers long. Charity is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not brag or boast. It's not arrogant or selfish. It's not rude, not easily provoked. Love seeks the best for others rather than self. Gets no satisfaction in the sins and failures of others. Now, that's some definition of the love of God. That's, I, see, most of us look at that and say, well, that's what God's expecting of us. Yes, but first of all, that's, that's an absolute declaration of what the love of God is. God is not easily provoked. He's not jealous. He is not arrogant. He doesn't gloat in the sins of his children. He grieves over them. All of this, and I can prove that because when you get down a little further, it says, and love never faileth. Love never faileth. Now, our love fails. Our love for God fails. But his love for us is never failing. It's unrelenting. It keeps coming and pursuing. That's what I'm talking about here today. Unconditional. He's, it, that love is going to withstand all of our failures if we'll just turn to him in our failure and receive his love. That receiving his love releases the power of God in our lives. Because his love never fails. Now, I said God's love is a power he gives us. And the revelation of it is the power he gives us to change that inner power of the Holy Spirit. And it, it is a revelation of the love of God. I, I know now that I can pray about my sins and I can trust God because I know he loves me. And I, he, he doesn't remove me from my position in him. You know, look how it changes Paul, even himself. In 1 Corinthians, Paul had every reason to give up on these people. He had every reason to give up. He, he could have started his letter like this. Dear Corinthians, I wash my hands of you. You are an incorrigible people. The more I love you, the less you love me. You hate me, and all I've done is pour out my life for you. I leave you to your own devices Go ahead, fight it out. My work's finished. Amen. He had every right, every reason. Because it's true, the more he loved them, the less they loved him. Church full of failure. But Paul had been apprehended by the love of God. He said, how can I not love these people when God loved me even when I was persecuting his body? How could I not do that? And even though he turns the man over the destruction of the flesh, that his soul may be saved, he did it in mercy. And then he turns to the man when the man's in despair and says, now that you have repentance of heart, come back. And oh, yes, he reproved sharply, the scripture says. But he said he did it through tears and he did it with the gentleness of a nurse. Paul preached the triumph the triumph of the love of God. And these carnal people melted under that message. Can you imagine when that was read to the body and they're looking at each other and here's, here's the man who's suing this man over here and this man's looking at him and saying, Saint? He's no saint. He's suing me. <laughs> and everybody look at the fornicator. A saint? No, 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 no. We're going to throw him out. I know he, if he continues to sin, he's to be put out of the church. He's to be put out of the body. There's discipline. There's spiritual discipline and there's the discipline of the body of Christ by leadership. But you see, Paul had experienced the love of God. And do you know what that kind of preaching did to these people? absolutely melted and changed them. I told you that the love of God is the power to change. The unrelenting love of God. The revelation of it is the power to change. And here's what the scripture says. You sorrowed unto repentance. Godly repentance. You cleared yourself. You, you became careful. You became indignant over your past sins. You, God put his true love and fear in your heart. 
You were filled with zeal. You vindicated yourself. In all things, you proved yourself clear and clean before God. Folks, I am so convicted by this. You see, the eye is gone. Immediately after this, the Bible says they began to get a vision of, of those that were in famine. And they began to give. They began to collect offerings and giving. Not only their money, but themselves. They started giving. No, no longer are they all wrapped up in gifts and signs and wonders and miracles. Because up to this time, the, the, these people had been so centered in what they wanted for themselves and edifying themselves. But they were transformed by this love. This mess means, you know, fuck, that convicts me because for so many years in my younger ministry and even occasionally in my later years, I've looked on the evil condition of the church, and the backslidden condition of many in the ministry. <clears throat> and I've set out with what I thought was a holy zeal to correct it. And I came in like a wild bull with a sledgehammer. And... I just started swinging the sword in all directions. Now, Paul the Apostle had come in to that church and started swinging a sword. If he'd come with a sledgehammer. Now, the Word of God is a hammer, the Bible says. But it's in the hands of a velvet glove. And I want you to know, if he had gone in, yes, fornication would have been gone. Adultery would have been gone. All of these things, they would have probably stopped suing one another, but the church would have dissolved. It would have been gone. It would not have existed anymore. Boy, do I pray for wisdom. Wisdom of the Holy Ghost. To come against carnality and sin in a righteous manner. Oh, yes, we're to, we're to cry out against sin. We're going to have to do it through tears. If, if I stand in this pulpit and I don't weep when I talk about sin in the house of God, or in this world, then I'm in hypocrisy. There has to be that brokenness. Do you know why, in my early years, I preached this in-your-face kind of preaching? <clears throat> I, I, I listen to some of my old sermons, and I, I, I say, turn it off. I don't want to hear it. <clears throat> I can't have it. <clears throat> I, 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 no, I, I can't. That's all I knew. But I, looking back, I know why I preached that way, because I was not convinced he really loved me. I wasn't convinced of his love. I, I, I thought, I'm not worthy of it. I can't live up to his standards. I fail too much. And so how can he love me? How can he love me? So a lot of my crying out was my own agony. This terrible agony, that, and, and it brings guilt and condemnation where it shouldn't be. And finally, Paul speaks of the community or, or the communion of the Holy Ghost. The word communion there in Greek is fellowship, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Now, at first, these Corinthians didn't know anything about fellowship. Everything was me. Everything was I. Paul said, each one of you say, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Paul, but I'm of Christ. And added to that individualism, there was an individual attraction to the gifts of the Spirit. So that there had been evidently such disorder that Paul has to write uh, clearly and explicitly to this body in Corinth, saying, look, there's not divine order. He said, you come in and one has a gift of tongues. And so he, there, there's four or five messages. Everybody's waiting for the one to sit down so the next one can get over his message. And here's somebody itching to interpret. And here's somebody over here has a word of wisdom. And everybody's coming to church. And everybody's gathered together to edify themselves. So that they can leave and say, I had a blessing. I gave a prophecy. I gave a word of wisdom. I, I was mighty in the spirit today. This was in the church. It was, it was, it was a church full of individuals not connected to each other. Totally disconnected. All kinds of gifts, all kinds of things going on that look spiritual. 
but it brought great grief to the heart of God. The deepest work of the Holy Spirit is to establish fellowship and unity in the body. The greatest work of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with the gifts. Those are great works. Those are spiritual. Those are needed. But the greatest work and the hardest work of the Holy Spirit is to unite the body, as Jesus said, to be one. I'll tell you, the Holy Ghost has a big enough job getting two Christians together, let alone a whole church. Paul ties this fellowship in to the other two previous issues. He said, if you're going to understand the grace of God, the love of God, it has to bring you together. And I'll tell you what what brings the body together, where there's no jealousy, where nobody is being easily provoked by another, where everybody is rejoicing in the blessing of another, and all these things we've been talking about. When we truly experience the love of God, you don't have to sit here and you see somebody bless say, well, God loves, God loves him more than loves me or loves her more than loves me. And no, you're not comparing yourself with anybody else. You're, you're just anxious to give, to give of yourself. Paul said they, they not only gave of the material things, but they first of all gave themselves. Now you come here, you give your praise, you give your tithe, and you give your offerings. Have you understood that God says, now I want you to give yourself one to another? And, folks, we're just beginning to see that more and more in this church, how God is making a body, bringing people together of all races, all colors, bringing them down to one blood. Glory be to Jesus. Give me five more minutes. Now, having said all this, what's the point? What does this have to do with my everyday walk with Jesus? It simply boils down to this. Are you willing to be changed? Are you willing to allow the Holy Ghost to show you where you need to change? And I I am open to the Holy Spirit. I said, God, after all these years and, and 71 years of age, now I'm asking you. I'm asking you to show me the areas in my life that have to be changed. Now, I can tell you how much God loves you and loves you unconditionally. He loves you with uh, unrelentingly with his grace. But there has to be a purpose to it. There has to be a purpose to it. It doesn't mean anything if I just tell you God loves you. Because you come to me and say, well, I'm a good man. I, I'm, I'm a good person. I, I, I'm not into any gross sin. And, and uh, I, I've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, we've been born with an Adam nature. And I'm going to tell you something. You've got a problem today. You, you've got a real problem. I'm going to tell you. It's not a money problem. It's not a family problem. And it's usually not a lust problem. It's an old nature problem. It's the old nature in us. And we're constantly trying to change that old nature. We're trying to do something. We're trying to improve it. I'm going to tell you something. Your old nature, your flesh is always going to be flesh and you can't change it. It's beyond redemption. It has to be crucified. And when I say it's crucified, it... I can't do that. It's something I acknowledge that Christ done at Calvary. So I acknowledge, I admit, I say that I cannot in my own flesh, please God, I cannot come into the fullness of His grace, His peace, His mercy, and His love. I can't fully understand it. My problem is that I've been fighting against something that I was born with, my nature. We have a sin nature in us. It manifests itself different in every individual. The various kinds of lust that come out, but it's all from this root nature. You can't, re- you can't redo it. God's not interested in redoing your old nature. He's not. Listen, my flesh will always be flesh. I don't expect any good thing out of my flesh. I, I don't know any man after the flesh anymore. Listen to me closely, please, because this is the key in the heart of understanding and receiving the revelation of his love and the ultimate goal of his love, the change that we're talking about. He has to give you a new nature, the very nature of Jesus Christ. 
It's a new nature. The old has to pass away. Now, when it says my man crucifies, that the, the flesh is crucified before the Lord, it means that I look at it as, as not being able to help me. I look at it as dead, as having anything to do with my salvation. I can't change it. There will always be flesh. It's always going. If, if the flesh could be changed, then this battle with the spirit would have ended. And he said, no, there's going to be a battle between the flesh and the spirit until you die. I'm trying to make this as simple as I can because this is the key to the new covenant. The new covenant is not just about power over sin. God's been dealing with me so much about this. I can't tame all these promises just for forgiveness and power over sin. Because I can have power over sin by the covenant and still have Prejudice in my heart. I can still not come in. He's bringing us out of sin to take us into the promised land. It's something he wants to do about our whole nature. Not just about forgiving our sins. You can be sitting here forgiven of your sins. And still not loving your brother, not be in unity. Because he wants more than just forgiveness. The new covenant has made provision for a new nature. God says, I'll be God to you. And the only condition is faith. Nothing can change me but my faith in his promises. Great and precious promises whereby I'm made a partaker or a sharer of his divine nature. Glory be to God. God loves me to change me. In the very image of Jesus Christ. Not only the image of Jesus Christ, but the very character of Jesus Christ coming out in me. And when you get this nature, you don't start. With the fullness. Everyone has been given the scriptures in a measure of faith. I used to think that oh, you, the only way you can have faith is if God gives it to you. Well, he's given you already, everyone. Everyone has a measure of faith. The most vile sinner has a measure of faith. You have the capability to believe. You have the capacity to believe. If you believe his promise that God said, I'll be God to you. I'll be merciful to your sins. And I'll provide every resource you need to fulfill every command that I made of you because I love you. So it all comes down to this. Lord Jesus, show me where I need to change. I don't have this kind of grace that Paul's speaking about. If you tell me that you believe God loves you unconditionally, you're confessing that you have in you the power to change by his grace. That's the confession. If you say, think about it a minute. If you say, I know God loves me, you're saying, you're confessing without knowing it, I have the power by the Holy Spirit to be changed. Well, folks, that's it. Will you stand, please? If you're here this morning in the annex, the overflow, or here in the main auditorium, the balcony, wherever you may be, I can tell you knowledgeably by the intuition of the Holy Spirit that some of you walked into this church this morning not really believing in your heart that God still loves you. Because of failure, because of something of, of drifting away from him, whatever it may be, and you came in here, you're not convinced that God loves you. And, and usually that's the reason people don't pray anymore. That's the reason people give up, because they've given up on this, this knowledge. They've given up on this truth that God keeps pursuing in love. The Holy Ghost has been called the hound of heaven, not to hound you about your sins, but to hound you in love about his mercy and his great love. I'm going to tell you now, he's not mad at you. You, you say, Brother Dave, there's no way 
See, I'm talking about those who received Christ as Lord at one time. And you're here now. And you're going through a struggle, a terrible struggle. You said, there's no way that he could be looking at me and calling me one called to be a saint. He can't look at me and call me sanctified. There's no way. You may have a Corinthian streak in you. You may have the spirit of Corinth in you. I don't understand that kind of grace, but I know I've experienced it. I don't understand it fully, but I, I've experienced it. I've experienced God's mercy that in my most failing hour, he's come to me with that still small voice, David, I still love you. You're still mine. And because you're mine, let me change you. Let me bring you back into the fullness. If you'll just trust my promises now. You'll just confess it. Don't harden your heart. Let my spirit bring your condition to match your position. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you're here, you say, oh, Brother Dave, I need this message. I, I needed some hope this morning. That's the good news of the gospel. Not just the flip and God loves you. You, you can see that in, uh, in, on car stickers and posters all over the world. Nobody loves me because that's how he works, the power of change and they to become Christ-like. Father, I pray for everyone in this building and those in the annex, wherever they may be, Lord Jesus, by your spirit, now open up our minds to receive, to receive that love. Let us not reject that love. God, that's what grieves you more than anything else, that we should, we, that we should reject this unrelenting love of God. Do it for us, we pray. Change hearts this morning. Bring peace. Lift the burden of guilt and condemnation as we confess our need to you and our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Wherever you're at, I'll pray with you. You step right out of your seat, Pastor Dave. This was for me. Upstairs in the balcony and even in the annex. Go to the hallway and the ushers will show you how to get down here. And you can meet me right here at the front of this altar. Those in the overflow, those in the annex. You feel the Holy Spirit tug you? Don't come in the Spirit. Now, you may be backslidden. You may, you may not know Jesus. You've not accepted Christ as Lord. Come and receive Him as Lord and Savior this morning. The, the, the greatest thing that I've ever learned in my life, other than the victory of the cross, and that's a part of what I'm about to say, is the day I became fully, totally convinced that I'm loved by God. And when I know that, and when I rest in that, come into that rest that remains for the people of God, then that enables me to love others. It's going to be hard to love others when you don't feel that you're loved by God. How are you going to love if you're not sure of it? Will you let him love you? Now, would you just, just, say, it, just say it right now, Lord Jesus... I receive your love. Cleanse me. Sanctify me. Help me in my struggle. But never let me doubt your love again. God loves me through Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. And by faith, I agree with that and I receive it. And Lord, the next time I doubt that, Send back this word and quicken it by the Holy Spirit that I can come back and rest in your love. In my worst failure, not as an excuse to sin, but to melt my heart and woo me back into your presence. Lord, I give you thanks. Just do that. Just thank him. In your own words, I give you thanks. Lord, I give you thanks with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In closing this service, I 
I just have to tell you what a church God has raised up here in New York. I'm going to boast in him, not in you or me or any of the past, boast in him. Here's, here's a city that's under orange alert. Here's a city that everybody talking about being pushed by the government. Go out and get duct tape and seal yourself in. <laughs> and nobody is hiding behind duct tape here. And th- I'll tell you what, this, this church was full and the overflow is full. And I, when Pastor Carter flipped to, to look in the overflow and it was full, I said, to myself, I said, I told Pastor Carter, that's amazing. And in my heart, I said, what a church. What a people that are not afraid. That is a testimony. When, when people are afraid to come in to the city, you came. People are afraid to go in the subways. Even political leaders who have children, those in Washington have children here, sent telephone calls and telegrams to their kids to not to get on the subway for a week. Well, here we are, subway, bus, train, everything else. No fear. No fear. Oh. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message. I want to talk to you this morning about the, the unreasonableness of faith. Faith is totally illogical. Totally unreasonable. The unreasonableness of faith. This, this mess has been born out of fire and floods. It may seem a little disjointed. I, I don't even know where I'm going to go with it. But I know it's burning in my heart. It didn't borrow it. It didn't get it from a book. Uh, I got it in a hospital room. <clears throat> Father, I thank you. How precious you are to us in the time of need. And Father, I... I sense and I know in the spirit that there are many that are here this morning that are going through the testing time of their life. Many that are discouraged to the point of being at wit's end. And Lord, I know that you always have a word for us, how faithful you are. Now, Lord, I I come as your servant and I yield my body, my spirit, my mind and all to you. Lord, you've been speaking to me in a little hospital room. Uh, while waiting on my wife and just speaking into my heart something for this body this morning, but mostly for my own heart. And the way you spoke to my heart and, and your great love and mercy and how to get out of despondency, how to get out of uh, the feeling of despair, whatever the enemy may bring into our lives. And we pray this morning that you would speak supernaturally to everyone hearing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, when, when God demands of us believe, have faith, he's making the most uh, unreasonable request ever made to mankind. The very definition of faith is unreasonable. We are told that faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not even seen. <laughs> there's, no, there's no evidence. It's, 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 it's totally beyond logic. And he asked us to believe and to have faith. Now, let's talk about this unreasonableness of faith. You, I'm going to take you into the Old Testament and then into the New Testament and just give you a picture of how unreasonable it is. And then you'll understand a little more about what you're going through and how to face it. At least this is how God delivered me from... Uh, it's not just this time. We all go through. You know, uh, people that are discouraged, people are going through it, <clears throat> don't live there. God delivers you, and there can be a whole season, a wonderful season when you're free and rejoicing. It's called the good times. Enjoy them because the, the discouragement is going to come flooding in again. And usually troubles come in threes and fours and tens and twelves. And, and uh, sometimes it never seems to end. But consider the, the faith demanded of Noah. When you, when you stop and look at this picture, you see how totally illogical it is. There, there's no sense, there's no rhyme, there's no reason given to this man. Here's a generation that's spun out of control completely. 
a generation of giants that are giving birth to what the Bible calls mighty men, a generation that has gone so violent, God says, I can't handle it anymore. It's beyond my ability to stand with it. It's enough. I'm going to destroy the earth. Uh, I'm going to destroy mankind. And in this time of murder and violence, God comes to this man, Noah, and he says, I, I'm going to destroy mankind. Their violence has come up before me, and I want you to build an ark. And you've got 120 years yet of mercy. And in that 120 years, I want you to build an ark, and I want you to collect two of all animals on the face of the earth. Now, folks, he had to be collecting that for 120 years. I don't know how long. It may have been the last 20 years after the ark was built. I don't know. But can, can you conceive of how unreasonable a request this is? Uh, and to feed them and to provide uh, uh, food for all of these animals? And he, gave, he, he comes to and he gives them the size of it. He gives them the width and the the length and one door and one window. God speaks to this man and gives him this incredible step of faith. And he's to do this in spite of the fact that there were giants all around him and mighty men, the scripture says, and these were violent men, violent giants, violent people all around him, skeptics, and God says it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and he had to explain to him what rain was. And for 40 days and 40 nights, there's going to be this cataclysmic event come, and all he is given is a word, just a word from God, just directions from God, just a word. That's what this is. That's what this book is. It's the word of God. And that's all he's given, and he's asked no evidence no, nothing else. God didn't send an angel down there as an architect in human flesh and, and draw him the design. He gave him the design. He did it all and totally unreasonable. And he was told, believe this. And he was told to keep his heart moved with fear. This whole time, for 120 years, he keeps his heart moved by fear on the sheer word of God. Nothing else. No other evidence, nothing. Now, folks, when you stop to think of this task and, and how difficult it is, pe people still believe it's impossible and they mock it. They say there's no such thing as a flood. There. How could he gather animals from all over the earth at that time? And in the face of all this opposition, when giants could have broken through and destroyed, I, I don't know how many times he, he must have been thwarted in every area he turned. How many times were he discouraged? How many times did a voice come to him and say, uh, Noah, what are you doing? This is foolish. Are you sure you heard a voice? Do you really have the word? You're stepping out on this for 120 years. This, this, this could be just a dream. You're a fool. But he kept coming back to the word of the Lord. And that kept him all this and that saved a whole generation. Noah and his family. He Hebrews 11th chapter, if you'll turn there for just a moment, speaks of, of Noah in verse 7, chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah. Now, this is all this man has. This is the only thing this man has to act in, in, in this most unusual way, oh, I am so glad I was not living in that day. I'm so glad I was not Noah. <laughs> by verse 7, by faith, Noah. This is all. Being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Evidence of things not seen. He, he is told to do this, all of this simply on an act of faith, believing the word. He prepared an ark to the saving his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. What is the righteousness by faith? Hearing the word, believing it, and acting upon it. Nothing else. One word. I don't believe God kept coming back to him time and time again. He gave it to him, and he says, I want you for the next 120 years to look back to this word that I gave you, and you live on it, you act on it, and you believe it. 
You say that's unreasonable? There's no logic to this story whatsoever, but God answered for You think of Abraham. God said, go out and leave your country. Abraham says, where? He said, I'm not telling you. Just go. Just get your family together, pack up, and start in a direction I'll tell you. I'll give you direction. I'll give you a pointer. And he, he gives him his first step, and that's all. Nothing else. Totally unreasonable. You wives, how would you like if your husband came to you and said, I have a word from God. Where to move? Where? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I want you to pack up. I want you to, we're selling everything. The house goes on sale, the furniture, everything. And we're going to uh, slim it down and uh, we're going to get a few camels and donkeys and we're going to, we're moving. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's a step of faith. By faith, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for inheritance, he obeyed. He went out, not knowing where he was going. Not knowing where he's going. How often we, we want God to tell us what's happening to us and why we're going through it, Lord. What's the next step? Where am I, where am I going, Lord? Folks, I don't know where I'm going. If you do, please tell me how you worked it out with God. I don't have the slightest idea what holds tomorrow or down the road. that We have plans that we have made, but I don't know how they're going to turn out. I don't know the next step. The Lord says, you go and I'll be with you. That's all he said. I am, will be with you. And God said, that's all you need. If I never give you another word, I'm with you. No harm can come to you. Obedience, he, you know, he takes him out on a starry night and he says, Abraham, look up, see the innumerable stars, number, count them if you can. That's amazing. He stands out in the starry. In those days, we, they didn't have lights. They didn't have electricity. Those nights were dark. And how the, the star, the heavens would light up and he says, Abraham, start counting. Start right there in the middle of that big bright star and, and start counting them. Abraham must have shaken his head. I, I remember being down in Marco Island on vacation. I'm standing on a starry night, and I'm thinking about how about God's grace and about what my part is and what God's part is in, in living a righteous life. And, and I heard a still small voice that David, jump over the moon. I thought, that's, that's not from God. Jump over the moon. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you can no longer, you can no more save yourself. You can no more work your way into my good graces than you can jump over the moon. And you've got to see how hopeless and helpless it is to present any flesh to God and be saved. It's absolutely by faith, by grace alone. He gives you the power. He gives you, yes, he, he will enable you. If folks, if one day I'm going to jump more than over the moon, I'm going over the sun and the stars and I'm going to heaven. I'm going to glory in that day. Hallelujah. He comes to him and he says, I am the Lord. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. There it is again. Faith. Counted obedience. Not just believing, but acting on that faith is counted for righteousness. Faith demands that we hear the word of God, we hear his promises with no evidence, and that we act on it and base, and, and base our whole life and our future on the word of God. What about the children of Israel? Think about the conditions that God brought them into. The Bible says he brought them to this place where there are mountains on both sides and the sea in front of them and chariots from from Pharaoh rushing down upon them. And you know, I, I look at that scene, it's totally unreasonable to expect. In my flesh, when I look at that, I said, God, 
I, that doesn't seem fair to me. All their children are crying. You can't get across that sea. They have no boats. They have no rafts. And they get 20 feet in and it's over their head. What are they going to do with their children? And they look back. All the spotters on the hills can see the dust of these chariots. Lord, in, in one night you slew all the firstborn. Why, why didn't you just slay all of those? Why didn't you slay all those charioteers and that army and leave them in the desert? What's the difference of drowning them in the water or leaving them die in the dust? And I said, Lord, that doesn't seem fair. It's unreasonable that with all the crying children and, and they've obeyed you and yet you allow this thing, and God led them into this situation. But God expected them to believe the word they'd been given. The word was, I am going to take you in my arms, and I'm going to carry you through a wilderness, and I am going to let, uh, no enemy is going to prosper against you, and I am will be with you. Just stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. It was a word that God give, gave to them. And I want to tell you something. God has absolutely no patience. He's a patient, loving God. But he has no patience whatsoever with unbelief. There's none. And, and my flesh wants to say, well, Lord, give them a little slack. Man, these people... I mean, if I'd been there, I'd have been crying. I'd have been murmuring and complaining. Believe me, I would because I've done it on this side of the sea. Mm-hmm. Come on, you, you look at ten times God brought them into place. He brings them into to, tomorrow to the bitter waters. And, and He's waiting for ten times. The Bible said they provoked him ten times. Provoke, provoke, provoke. What is the provocation of Israel in the wilderness? Time and time again, God was trying to find something of faith in them on which he could build. He, he was trying to find a testimony to all the world and to all history. That here's a people, when I take them into hard places... I expect them to act on my word so that the testimony, that my word, I, this is the living God. The word is here in its life. And God wants that known. He wants it to be practiced. Folks, we have no other way to get out of any situation we're in except the word of God. You tell me of any doctor, psychologist, preacher, evangelist, anybody in the face of the earth can get you out. Of any situation you're in, you say, well, send me a millionaire and I'll show you how to get out. No, because if you got out of that, you'd have some affliction hit your body. You have something happen to your family. They can't get you out of all of these things. There is only one hope, and that's the living word of God. Unreasonable, yes. But God demands of us that we act and believe and act on his word. You know, this is the, the, the question was asked, uh, why, why is there no food? Why is there no water? Why are we in this condition? Why did you bring us out here to kill us? And I don't think it's changed. We don't use the same words, but Lord, why this test? Why am I going through this present condition that I'm in now beyond my comprehension? We still keep asking that. And, and folks, God is a loving father, but I don't believe he owes us an explanation when he's given us the answer. He's given us everything that we need in Christ Jesus, all that we need for life and godliness, all we need for every situation in life has been given to us. And so it was with these in, in the wilderness. You know, the Lord has at his disposal... All the resources, he has the willingness, and, and, and he could just speak the word at any moment and deliver you and me out of every situation before we go into it. He could do it halfway through. He could do it at any time. And you have to have this in your mind. I know that God has the authority, he has the power, he has the resources, and he, he, he does not... Put suffering on his people promiscuously for no reason. 
He, he doesn't allow us. Now, the Bible says that God himself led the children of Israel into that condition, into that scary place. And some of you are in that frightening place where you feel stripped and you feel empty, you feel hopeless and you feel helpless. And what does God expect of you? Folks, God allows that human flesh to have its tantrum. We're human, yes, and there are times that, I'll tell you what, if people, when, when, there, when some loved one dies, I know when Tiffy died, uh, people don't understand, you know, some people think, if, I, if you have faith, you don't cry. No, if you have faith, you do cry. And, and, and I, I, I cried a river of tears, and others, and there, there's healing power in that, but you, you, you didn't hear from our family. We, you didn't hear the complaint, God, why did you do this? Why did you do this? What, what did I do? And sometimes when we get in these places, we say, Lord, what, what kind of sin did I commit? What did I do wrong? Is this judgment? Some of you right now are going through the greatest trial you've ever had. You are as discouraged as you've ever been. Now, God wouldn't deal with me like this and give me this message for you unless he intended you to hear something of a supernatural uh, kind of voice from heaven to show you that the situation you're in right now is common to all men. It's not unusual. When we sent out on our mailing list an announcement about Tiffy's passing, 13-year-old granddaughter from cancer, uh, just hundreds and hundreds of letters from all over the world. And I was shocked at the numbers who wrote, said, we lost our three-year-old granddaughter to brain cancer. So many from brain cancer, children. A mother who wrote, said her daughter, the day after 9-11, was sitting in the schoolyard. They were sitting with the family, and a tree uh, branch falls, hits her on the head and kills her. And one after another, my my. 16-year-old daughter was murdered and mutilated. And they were encouraging us. They were, they, were, they were not writing and complaining and saying, why did he do that? Why, why did God allow that? Folks, I don't know why, how these things, but that's what happened. The children of Israel kept asking why when all the time they had the word of the Lord. They had all the resources they needed if they would have drawn upon them. If they had really believed what God said, and it's an amazing thing, God doesn't come along with anything other than his word. He comes, yes, he sends angels at time, but he does that for those who believe his word. He's, he's not an impatient God. He, he, he allows us to express our, our fears. He, he allows us to say, I, I'm overwhelmed, I feel down, and, and sometimes you'll pick up the phone and call somebody and just, you, you don't take it out on God, but you say, this is over me, I'm over my, I'm at wit's end. And you, it, it, it's a form of murmuring and complaining, but maybe not uh, meaning any harm by it. And God give you time for that. But folks, I'm going to tell you, and I, 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 I warn you in the love of God, and I know from the experiences that I've had with a lot of suffering and <clears throat> ministry and in the family, spiritual, physical, mental, all kinds. I don't know any man or woman of God hadn't gone to hell and back with one trial, difficulty after another. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And the Lord delivers them out of them all, yes. But how? He allows you to go through that. But if you hang on to that why, if you hang on to those questions, if you, if you hang on to the doubt and unbelief, you're going to spin out into a pit that you can never get out. And you're going to harden your heart. And you're going to get angry at God. And the Lord expects you. He'll give you time. But there comes a time that you have to lay hold of the word of God. And if you just sit and languish in, in your affliction, if you just sit and languish and go over questions, Lord, how did this happen? Where am I going next? What's going to happen next? And you don't get into this book and you don't get a hold of the promises. He's given us every promise we need for every condition. And finally, the Lord will come to you and say, look, 
you have no excuse for the condition, for, for your feelings right now. You have no reason to accuse me or to doubt me. You have none whatsoever because I have given you a promise. I've given you everything that you need and I expect you to lay hold of it now. And if you lay hold of it, I'll anoint that word by the Holy Spirit and it'll become life to you. It'll be healing power above any medicine you could ever know or take. The word of the Lord. This is the answer. It's the only answer. It's the only hope. It's the only hope for Israel. And they, the scripture says, here's the promise that had been made to them before they marched. I will bring you out of affliction into a land flowing with milk and honey. No one will be able to stand against you. The great I am will be with you. Not a promise shall fail. Not a promise shall fail. But hear that again. I will bring you out of affliction. I don't know who I'm talking to. But to some of you here this morning that are in great affliction, God's promise to you is I will bring you out of your affliction. This is going to pass. Every one of those trials, those ten trials of Israel passed. And they ended up, their carcasses lying dead in the wilderness, simply because they would not enter in, the scripture says, because of unbelief. Some, when they had heard, did provoke him. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That unbelief aroused the wrath of God to a loving people that were destined to be his witnesses to, for all, all time and into eternity. But they would not go back and remember and stand on the word of God. They wanted something reasonable. They wanted something they could see and feel and touch. They wanted somebody to spell out their pathway. But that's not faith. Faith, faith is saying, God has given me a promise, and I lay hold of that promise, and I'm going to live and die on that promise. I'm going to cast my whole life, everything I have, on the word of the living God. Hallelujah. With whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them who had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? They believed not. So we see they could not enter into his rest because of unbelief. And, folks, you can go into the Bible and from cover to cover in Scripture. You find men and women of God going through great troubles and great afflictions. It's all through the Bible. It's all about the afflictions of mankind. The psalmist wrote in his affliction, Why is my soul cast down? Why this restlessness in me, this disquietness in me? He said, why do I, what do you say, why do I feel so helpless and so useless in my affliction? Have you ever been there, folks? When you felt helpless and say, I'm not of use to anybody. And that's what came over David. You hear Elijah under juniper tree begging God to kill him. He's so downcast, he's ready to quit on life and his ministry. Jeremiah cried out, Lord, you've deceived me. And I was deceived. I will no longer mention your name. He said, that's it. I don't understand this, God. And what he was really saying, I've done nothing but seek you. I've given my life to you. I've prayed. But I feel now that I've, I have been deceived. Lord, you've deceived me. Because everything that you told me to preach, I don't see any of it happening. I've been made a fool, is what he's saying. Now, God understands that. But I want to show you how these men came out of it. And how in the middle of their affliction, the Spirit of God came down, turned the light on, and showed them the answer. Remember what David said. David said, thy words were found. And I consumed them. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. That's uh, David said, uh, 
But was it Jeremiah cried, Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived, and I will no longer mention his name. His despair, though he cried out, Thy words were found, and I did consume them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. David said, I remembered your word. Elijah said, Lord, your word came back to me. Jeremiah saying, I remembered your word. And that word became the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And it was the remembering of his word. It was coming back to his word that all of these men go all through the Old Testament. You'll find the same story. These men came out of it, not by counselors. The Lord waited. He listened to their human outcry. And now he says, all right, you've cried it out. You've had your time. Now will you trust me? Will you go back to my word? Will you lay hold of that promise? If you lay hold of that promise, I'm going to see you through. Folks, it doesn't matter how you got into your trial. It doesn't matter how you got discouraged, whether it came from God, whether, whether a situation God has allowed, or whether the devil brought it into your life, or whether it's your flesh. It doesn't matter how or where it came from. The only thing that matters is how you get out of it. And there's no other way out of it but this. Uh, you go to the New Testament and And suddenly, you find out what appears to be the most unreasonable demands ever made on mankind. Can you imagine the Jews? For for centuries, they've they've been taught, and they've been looking for this Messiah. And this Messiah that they believe is coming, is coming in majesty and power. He's going to come with an army. It's going to be such a mighty army. He's going, to overpopul- he's going to overrule every army on earth. He's going to go into Rome and destroy the Roman Empire and break the yoke of the Romans from their neck. And they anticipate that he's going to make them a prosperous nation, the greatest nation on earth. And this mighty deliverer called the Messiah is going to come and set them free from their poverty and no more pain, no more sickness. And he's going to come in great majesty. Instead, he comes on a donkey. He comes born in a stable. He comes with an unreasonable life history. No earthly father. An immaculate conception. And and, and here are these Jews that all their lifetime anticipating this kind of Messiah. And here comes this lowly man, this Meek, lowly Nazarene. And they say, we know who his father is. We know his mother. He's a carpenter. And he's calling himself God in flesh. Folks, it was the most unreasonable thing to expect from these people faith. How do you believe somebody that's fixing your dining room table is God? How do you believe that this man, now here in Jerusalem, Gamaliel sits with hundreds of young, brilliant scholars, and here are the scribes, the brilliant men of the day, and they're teaching in palaces. And here is the man who cries he's the Messiah, and he's out by the river or in a hillside teaching the poor and the lepers and the lame. And he's saying, believe in me, I'm God in flesh. You hear this man saying, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you can't get to heaven. And they've been spending all these years working themselves to heaven with 663 rules and regulations. And he comes along and said, just trust me. I'm from the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. If you don't believe in me, you don't believe in God. How... You think that if you were there, you would have, oh, thank you, Jesus. I, you are my Lord and my Savior. No, 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 no. Now you stop and think about this for a minute. The absolute illogic, the absolute unreasonableness of the demands of faith. This man does miracles, and they don't believe him. The miracles, he said, at least believe me for the miracles' sake, but they won't believe it. And, and, and 
Jesus says, I am the living son of God. No man comes to the father except by me. Now, you go into the temple and you watch him rush into that temple with cords and he's driving out the money changers. And they're saying he won't even tell us where he got the authority to do this. We don't know who he is. Think of a lowly man dressed in a seamless robe. And picture this as a synagogue without the electricity and and all the finery we have here. And a man walks in. A man walks in and he picks up the Torah. And he opens and starts reading from Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. And he closes the book. He says, I'm that man. The Lord says, believe it. The Pharisees are crying out, unreasonable. The, the, the Pharisees, are, he said, he that heareth my word and believeth on me shall have everlasting life. And the Pharisees cry out, you bear record of yourself. Your record isn't true. In other words, you're telling us that we're to believe just your word. To take you at your word. Get this. So I won't over preach you. I've been thinking about that this past week. The, the demands of faith. When, when God speaks to a whole generation and he comes, he says, I'm the living word. He that believe in me shall never hunger and never thirst. And it's all glory. I don't have to work anymore. He's going to feed us. Maybe he is the Messiah. Until he said, then eat my body and drink my blood. And the hard the saying was too hard. How do you believe this when you can't comprehend? Jesus said, I bear record of myself, yes. Yet my record or my word is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of myself. Why don't you understand? Because you cannot hear my word. And that's why we don't understand our afflictions. That's why we don't understand, because we, we are not hearing what he said. In, in our despair, in our hard times, we... we we go down and, and, and uh, lay down in that despair and just question. And we let this drag on and on and on when all you need to do is you don't even have to get on your knees. You just say, oh, Holy Spirit, you said that that's the life. These words are life and they're hope. And you go to the Psalms if you have to. Go into his word. Don't just open it up and say, Holy Ghost, lead me. Start in the first chapter in Psalm and start reading it. Mark it and, and, and let God speak to you by his word. And that's the only hope. Folks, it, we, we are living in a time. I'm going to close in just a moment. We're living in a time of the greatest revelation of the gospel in the history of mankind. We, we have more teachers. We have more supplies. We have more literature. We have more health books. We, we have, we're not, there's not a famine of the preaching of the word. There's a famine of hearing and obeying the word of God, but there's not a famine of preaching. There, there is powerful preaching all over the world today. Uh, in, everywhere we go in any land, you'll find powerful preaching, anointed preaching. You'll find those who've been shut in with God. And yet we, there's never been more distress. There's never been, uh, any more uh, affliction, mental, physical, and spiritual, never in history in spite of all of the Word of God. You know, amazing thing, pastors today, and I know, and, and God's been speaking to my heart about this. And you, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up now. 
And I want you to listen closely. Pastors now are, are having to spend almost all their time praying and getting messages to try to pick people up, pick their chin off the ground. How, how, how to conquer fear, how to do this, and, and five points to do this, and five steps to this, and, and how to deal with, with affliction and despair, and all of these things helps. Oh, oh, lifting up. Folks, there's nothing wrong with that. But you see, the, the real problem, the real issue is this. He has already given us a word. It's here. It's finished. And God expected it out of Israel. He expected it out of the Jews. And He expects it out of you. And He expects it out of me. That I don't need a preacher coming to me with steps. I don't need somebody trying to just keep propping me up. Trying to bring me some human source of encouragement. I have got to believe what God said and I have to take quality time and get here and study the Word until I bring out of it a message of hope. I want to close with this. Five more minutes. I want to give you an imagined conversation between the Lord and uh, I'll call this man discouraged Christian. A little conversation. Get your Bible out. Put it on your lap and open to Psalm 33 and Psalm 32. I got up early this morning. I was sitting at my desk and praying and I said, Lord, how do I close this message and try to try to make it clear? And it, I received this from the Holy Spirit. It's just a simple little thought. A conversation between the Lord and discouraged Christian. All right. Discouraged Christian comes to the Lord. And he says, Lord, I'm down and I'm discouraged. You promised you would not allow me to bear more than I would be able to bear, but you'd make a way of escape, and I don't see it. I'm overwhelmed. If you would only tell me, explain to me what this is all about. The Lord is answered. Psalm 32. The Lord says, go to Psalm 32. You don't believe the Lord speaks like that? He spoke to me this morning and told me to go there for you and for myself. Psalm 32, start in verse 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. For thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with what? Songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And, folks, I want you to see that he, the deliverance is on the way. But the Lord said, I'm instructing you in this process. I'm guiding you into a new way. But don't be as the horse or as the mule which has no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. All right, we're talking about somebody in affliction. What's it say? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye who are upright in heart. You say, unreasonable. I'm hurting. I'm in affliction. Rejoice, be glad, and shout. Yes, because I am is on the throne. <laughs> Discouraged Christian, Lord, I'm feeling helpless. My strength is nearly gone. Fear and doubts plague my mind. I can't see a way out. And the future looks so hopeless. God says, go to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Start verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. You believe God sees you in your time and in your affliction, in your discouragement? 
That's what he said. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them, and fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart shall rejoice in him because we've trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. We hope in your word. One last conversation from discouraged Christian. Lord, sometimes I feel I must have offended you. Is this trouble judgment of some kind? And Lord, please tell me it's going to end sometime. God says, go to Psalm 34. Start in verse 6. This poor man cried. The Lord heard him and left him in all of his troubles. It's, my Bible says it saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord campeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is... The Lord's not being bad to you. The Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there's no lack or no want to them that fear him. The lions may lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not lack or want any good thing. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. And quote it with me. His ears are open unto the cry. Verse 17 out loud. The righteous cry, the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them of a broken heart, save such as of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Let's stand. Hallelujah. And the last word, the last verse, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. None of them that trust in him shall be left desolate. None that trust in him shall be left desolate. You won't be left in your situation. Oh, Jesus, forgive us for our unbelief. Lord, we're stressed out because we don't believe. We are in affliction so long, and we're not getting out of it because we don't believe. Lord Jesus, forgive our unbelief this morning. You're here to tell us there's no reason for you to stay where you're at. You can move out of it today. You can make a move of faith right now. Lord, this faith demands that we go back into your word we don't pick up the phone. We don't expect it to come just from a preacher. We come, it comes from digging into your word. God, get us back into the Bible. Get us back into the word so that we can have the resources we need in time of trouble. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love this morning. Now, I'm going to give an altar call, an invitation for those in this place. Now, uh, I believe... Some of you that are visiting here today, Lord sent you. He arranged all this. You thought it just happened. There's no such thing as happenstance with the Lord. He brought you here. He brought, this is one of the simplest messages I've ever preached. He brought a simple message to you. He, he, wants to, he wants to deliver you today, not just by laying on of hands, not just by somebody praying for you, but for you, saying, Lord, I'm going to step out of this by faith, and I'm going to quickly get into your word. And I'm going to lay hold of a promise, and I'm going to stay on that promise till I see total victory in my life. That has to do with temptation. It has to do with affliction. It has to do with discouragement. It has to do with fear, bondage of any kind. The Lord loves you, but he expects you to obey what he said. He expects you now. Not to expect deliverance from any other source, but you digging into his word. You find the promise. I gave you some, but I just told, do you understand it? There were just three chapters there. In three chapters, 
Look at all the promises. Look at all the hope and help that was given just out of three chapters. Can you imagine the whole book of Psalm? Can you imagine the whole book itself and all that he said to take us through the fires and the floods and everything else if we just trust in his word? Father, find out those that are here this morning who need a miracle, a deliverance through the word of the living God. Now, if you're here this morning, and I'm going to narrow it down. Otherwise, we'll just have the whole audience come. Because uh, we all have to go through these times. But if you're here this morning, and I, the Bible calls it wit's end. It means I can't go any further. I'm as discouraged as I've ever been. And I need the Holy Spirit to touch me today and lay this. I, I have to have a victory now. I want you to step out of your seat and come and stand here. We're going to believe God for you right now. Up in the balcony, go the stairs on either side. Say, Brother Wilson, this message was for me. I had to have this today. Now, not just those who are here for the first time, but those who come to this church, you're welcome to join these. If you're not right with God, if you've been running from the Lord, follow these that are coming. Nobody needs to know why you're coming. But you can come boldly to the throne of grace now and receive mercy. You step out and you believe the Lord right now. But don't come unless you say, I'm going to believe God's word. I'm going to step out in faith and lay hold of God's word. And in the annex and in the overflow rooms, you come from the overflow rooms into the big room and just move forward, stand between the screens, and I'll pray for you in just a moment. Step out. You've, you've got to identify this to yourself and to God. It's not just there, there's a reason for stepping out, and that's saying, I'm taking a step of faith. I want you to take that step right now. I asked the Lord to give me a word. And when I ask God for a word, you know, some type of people say, well, I want somebody to give me a word and someone just prophesies. I'd rather stick to the Bible. I'm going to stick right to the Bible. And here's the word that I received for those who came forward. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, which delivers the poor from him that's too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. The enemy has come to try to spoil should to defeat you. And the Lord comes to you with this word. said, who's like unto thee, O Lord, who delivers the poor from him that's too strong for him? You see what you're going through? You can't fight it in your flesh, can you? you, you some of you are tired fighting. You're tired of what you're going through. You're just tired and weary. Don't try to fight it anymore. Because you say, he said he's stronger than all my enemies. He's stronger than the forces of hell all demonic powers that come against me, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ear is open to their prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Everyone that came forward, and there may be others who are standing here, did not move. God, God sees your heart and he knows your cry. And if you pray this from your heart, I believe God will answer. Pray this with faith. Pray it from your heart. Lord Jesus, I don't understand. I'm overwhelmed, and I have hurt in my heart, because I don't want to be angry at you, Lord, but I need help today. I can't go any further unless you give me help and strengthen me. Forgive my unbelief. Forgive my questioning. And send your word to me. Send a word directly to my heart that I can stand on. Oh, Lord Jesus, I know you love me. You promised not to forsake me. And you said that this was above me. This is beyond me. And my enemy's too strong for me. And my conditions are too overwhelming. But I come as a child. To say, Lord Jesus, restore my confidence, my faith in your love and in your promise to keep me and protect me and forgive me. Now, let me pray for you. Father, I believe your word. This is how you have brought me out time and time again. Every affliction, every discouragement. Lord, 
you have sent your word to me. You, you told me that prayer was not enough. You can pray for hours. You can cry for hours. But until you stand on the word and believe it, nothing's going to happen. Lord, that prayer and all of our devotion, all of our times seeking you in intimacy has to end up in this. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. And they that come to him must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But without faith, we can't please you. Not our tears, nothing else. So we come now and say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe your word. Hallelujah. Now, how does God send his word to you? You take the first step. You've got to get this book open. You find some quality time. Turn off the television. Turn off the radio. Turn off everything. Go to some quiet spot, even in the office or wherever you can, wherever you can, but especially at your home, and say, Lord, and you've got, if you'll start in the Psalms, don't go promiscuously through the Psalm. Start at verse 1, chapter 1. Get a pen or pencil and mark it. And, and if he's not interested in how many chapters you read. You stop at a place where suddenly your heart leaps. This is where I am. This is what I need to hear. And you underline it and circle it and just put a big me right beside it. And every time you go discouraged, go back to that me and say, hey, that's me right here. Lord, I stand on that. You gave me that word 10 days ago and I'm standing on it now. And you keep standing until you've got at least 20, 30 verses that you can go back to and remember. And every time the devil comes and lies to you and say your future is going to be a mess and you're a mess. And so I don't care. What you think, devil? I can be a mess and still trust God. I can trust God with all my heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive our unbelief. They that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And the eyes of the Lord are open. Hallelujah. The Lord is near to those of a broken heart. And he saves those of a contrite spirit. And again, this poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles, all of his troubles. He saved him out of how many? All of them. I want you to just raise your hands and thank God for his goodness to you right now. Lord, we we raise our hands and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Thank you for your precious word, Jesus. Thank you for your precious word. This is the conclusion of the message.